continuing our series through the Sermon on the Mount. We're just uh, here at Matthew chapter 6. And once again, if you heard the reading uh, that Aniela brought, once again, it sounds like Jesus has changed the topic. And, and once again, as I reflected on last week, one of the bad habits we get into when we read the Bible is we think the Bible is just a series of disconnected statements. But in fact, Jesus is continuing to build on the same theme. So the, the, the thing we've been looking at is what does faith look like? And Jesus has been leaning in on the topic of faith looks like how you give, faith looks like how you pray, faith looks like how you fast, and how you do these things not to get the instant reward of everyone being impressed by you because they can see how much you give, they can see how earnestly you pray, they can see how suffering, you know, how much suffering you're going through in your fasting. But instead, you actually do it in secret so that your Father who sees you in secret might reward you, uh, might reward you. And so you're looking for a heavenly reward instead of an earthly reward. And then last week, we looked at the, that, how Jesus uh, built that teaching and he said, in your life, Seek heavenly treasures, not earthly treasures. Have your heart and your affections turned to the things of God and seeing more of the life and the light of God shine through you out into the people around you. And even if that doesn't necessarily bring you an instant uh, physical reward, even if that doesn't increase the money in your bank account or increase your standing and reputation within society, nonetheless, actually focusing on a life that seeks to have the light of God shining through it is a life that will not only bless the most number of people around you, but will actually bring the most goodness and blessing into your life as well. And then Jesus lands on here. And the, the, uh, the key idea that Jesus is picking up here is the idea of you travel in the direction that you're looking at. You're traveling, you travel in the direction that you're looking at. Have you ever done a dream board? I picked this up from a, a website, funnily enough, Pete, in Canada. It's a Canadian website. Uh, it's about, uh, the website is about developing a passive income. So it's a, it's a website that encourages people to be able to build up their life so they have a passive income. That is, you don't need to go to a job, but you know, your, your money earns money, basically. And by doing that, you can end up increasing your bank account and you can end up having the lifestyle that you dream of. And one of the projects that they like to put people through is the, the project of having a dream board. Why is it that you're going to do the work to build up a, a, a financial base for yourself? What is the end goal of doing all this work, of earning all this money and of developing the wealth that this website wants you to encourage, uh, encourage you to develop? And so what they do is they get people to do a dream board, and this is their template dream board, which I thought was interesting. This is what they sort of show to everyone as the template that they can then build from. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. So what do you want to own? Uh, so they're suggesting this is, this is the house that you aspire to. Uh, the small image at the top left-hand corner is a beautiful home cinema. Boy, I'm jealous already. Just would love to have that home cinema. That really is good. Underneath that is a billiards room. Boy, I actually do enjoy some snooker. So... You know, that could, that could work for me. And then on the right, I think it's, I can't quite see, but I think it's like a jacuzzi with some nice... Uh, nice. So that's, 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 that's something to aspire to. You can see down the bottom, there's like a check, and it says, in 30 years' time, I want to have a retirement fund of $10 million in my bank. It'll be nice if I can get $10 million bucks in my bank. So there you go. Do, do you dream of this house? Do you dream of that car? Do you dream of having your own private plane? Is this the dream that's going to motivate you to put in the work and put in the effort to build a life that you want to live and to, to put in all the hard work and make the sacrifices so that this can be your end goal. Uh, in another corner, they say, well, what do you want to see? You know, so if you earn all this money, what is it that you want to do with it? Well, I want to spend it on travel. And so they suggest that these are maybe some places that you could put on your, on your dream list. I want to be able to travel to these places and have all of these experiences. Um, what do you want to sort of build up for yourself? This is a Canadian website, but on the template, they talk about gun collection and shooting ranges, which I thought was kind of odd. So you could be the owner of a shooting range. You, you, you can aspire to that. You can have a massive gun collection. You can start a high-tech startup company. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I mean, imagine the money that you could make from a high-tech startup company. And you could even uh, own a business that owns a, a yacht like that down there in the bottom left-hand corner. You could l lease that out. I mean, isn't this, this is the dream. This is the dream of being able to live a life of wealth and comfort and affluence. But of course, it's not all about you. So what you also need to do is make sure you give, because this is an important value. So with all the money that you're going to make, uh, this person, or the, 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 the template here is aspire to give about $33 million of your money away. So give like no one else. And this is particularly to helping people, to helping uh, special kids in needs, uh, alleviating hunger, homelessness, and supporting animal shelters. When you were young, what would you have put on your dream board? 
And I'm going to ask you in a moment, just around your tables, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I actually want you to, sh- to bounce this idea around with each other. When you were young, what would you have put on your dream board? And I put a couple of little questions there in white just to help you. So how did you want to live? What did you want to own? Where did you want to go? Who did you want to be with? What impact did you want to make on the world? Take yourself back into your younger years. And if you had to do a, a, uh, a dream board, what would that look like? Don't answer all those questions. I'm only going to give you, give you a couple of minutes. So just sort of the first thought, the first memory that comes to you, just share it with the people around you. But while you're, you're loading those stories up to share with each other, l- let me tell you one what, what of mine. I had, this, I had this idea that I could intersect a couple of things together and that my life was going to work out in a wonderful way. So the first thing that I, was, that I wanted to do was I wanted to study agriculture so I could go to third world countries and improve farming techniques to alleviate hunger. The second idea I had was somehow by doing that I was going to get really, really rich. I was going to build a business around that idea and I was going to get very, very, very wealthy and I really wanted to have a nice big house for myself uh, and I wanted to be able to retire by the time I was 40. So by, by the time I was 40, I didn't want to have to have a job so to earn money. I could sort of choose whether or not I wanted to earn money. So that was sort of an ambition that I That was on my dream board. Uh, and, then, uh, and then on top of that, of course, with all the wealth that I was going to accumulate, I wanted to be really generous. I wanted to be the kind of person who could just go around and give, give money to whoever I felt like I wanted to give money to. So it was the intersection of three things. I want to study agriculture to build an agriculture business to get me rich and give me the life that I wanted, the big house and be able to particularly retire by 40. When I was young, that was a really... Because 40 seemed so old. It's like, my goodness, if, if I turn 40 and I'm still working, I don't think I'll have the energy to keep working. It's just so old. You know, I'll be close to the grave. It's terrible. And then, of course, you know, I wanted to be generous. I wanted to, you know, out of the abundance of my wealth, be able to give money. Um, the reality I bumped into is I'm, I'm, I'm not great at maths. So I never did well in the math subjects in high school and in the engineering stuff. And I'm really, I'm actually more of an indoor guy than an outdoor guy. So even being up in a farming community, where I, which I was for 10 years, I did enjoy going out every now and again and helping the farmers, but none of them would ever hire me to do any work around farms. It's just, it was a fantasy that I had about my aptitude, but it was an expression of my appetite, my direction. It was, it was a little bit of an insight as to how I was thinking and who I was in my high school years. Let me give you a couple of, of minutes around your table. Uh, answer the question for each other. When you were young, what would you have put on your dream board? Hopefully you've learned something about the people around you. Maybe you got some extra little uh, tidbits of information about, about their, uh, their dreams and ambitions in their younger years. Can, uh, you can uh, ask them more questions about that over the tea and coffee, coffee time and over the lunch, luncheon time later on. What those dreams represent, what that vision board represents for each of us is something of the light that we thought would guide us through life. In our young years, as we imagine what our future might hold and as we had certain dreams and ambitions for ourselves, if you will, that dream and ambition was something of a spotlight a light that was shining a way forward into our future and for us in our younger selves defined what we thought the shape of our life would be. Now, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but ask yourself the question, how many of, how many of your dream board dreams of your younger self are now being completely and utterly true for you now? Don't put your hands up, but just process that question. To what degree did that light of your youth actually define and accurately predict the shape of the life that you now get to live? Or did your life twist and turn and move and develop in ways that maybe your younger self could never have predicted? Maybe for better, maybe not for better. And maybe the light which you're living in now is very different to the light that you thought you would be living in in your younger self. And what is the light that has guided you through life? What is the light that has actually proved to be stable and steady and helpful and healing and shaping for you? What is the light that has actually, maybe if you had have known in your younger self, you you could have put on the dream board to go, this is, this is the one, this is the truth, this is the light, this is the reality which has guided my life. Hold that thought. I want to take us into the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 because I think he intersects a lot with these particular ideas that we might have of ourselves. One of the expressions that we use is that our eyes are a window to the soul. You know, you have that experience where even people, a person might present themselves as being very well dressed and very well put together but if you take a moment to look deeply into their eyes, sometimes you can see that there's 
Maybe, uh, maybe there's more hurt or there's more guilt or there's more shame or there's other deeper things. Or maybe there's joy and energy and life and vibrancy that are coming through their eyes. And sometimes the way that a person dresses and combs their hair and puts the makeup on and presents themselves to the world where they were wanting to look maybe successful and powerful and impressive, when you look them in the eyes, sometimes the, the eyes give them away. Have you ever had that experience? You, you look and, you know, are you okay? You know, how's your day going? You, you, you know, have you ever had that instinct when you look, look in someone's eyes that you go, no, something's, something's not quite right. Even though everything else looks good, there's something about that person's eyes that gives them away. And so we have this, this understanding, and this is the understanding that we carry, particularly in our Western culture, that the eyes are a window to the soul. You look into the eyes of someone and you get to see something of the state of their soul. In Jesus' day, they had that idea, but they adapted it slightly. And Jesus is sort of picking up this particular uh, nuance or this particular way of thinking about the idea. In Jesus' day, the thinking was that your eyes are windows into the soul, but actually what your eyes do is your eyes let light into your soul. So your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. What the Jewish idea is, is not so much you get to see someone's uh, soul by looking in their eyes, but actually it's almost the other way around. Your soul is shaped by what you see. That's the Jewish idea. So what light you're letting into your eyes is going to form and change the shape of who you are. So if you look at righteous things, if you look at holy things, if you look at good things, if you like at healing things, if you look at positive things, it's going to bring righteousness and holiness and goodness and positivity into your life. If you look at dark things, then that darkness won't just be the darkness that sits out there, but your eyes are like a window. It allows that to come into you and that darkness affects who you are and affects something of the shape of how you are formed. And the instruction of Jesus is to have healthy eyes. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. Um, The uh, the Greek word here for healthy is not the word that the Greeks use to define health as in, I'm feeling healthy today, my body is, you know, I am well, I'm not sick, therefore I'm healthy. That's not actually the word that's being used here. It's a different word, which we translate as healthy in English, but it actually captures the idea of singleness of purpose. It's the idea of not being divided and being motivated by a single purpose, sincere and straightforward in all you do. And basically what it's saying is this, when your eye has a single focus, when your eye has a single purpose, when your eye is motivated in a straightforward and sincere way, not divided between two conflicting things, not caught up between two opinions, not spread out between two different ambitions that pull against each other, but a single-mindedness, then this single-mindedness is one of the ways in which health is brought into our body. And the context of what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew chapter 6, it's single-mindedness on what? It's single-mindedness on the treasures of heaven. It's single-mindedness in our giving. It's single-mindedness in our prayer. It's single-mindedness in our fasting. It's single-mindedness in living the life of humility and service. It's single-minded in loving our enemies. It's single-minded about being the people who reflect more of the light and the life of God into the world around us. Kind of got me thinking about orient- orienteering. If you've ever done orienteering, they give you a map and a compass, and then they say, here's point A, there's point B, good luck. And what they often do is they give you a bit of a path to walk that's deliberately, well, not a straight line. If you look at the map and you go point A, point B, and just draw a straight line between the two points, you can't actually walk it. That's not going to be a natural or an easy path for you to walk. And so what they expect you to do is to zigzag. You've got to walk around the obstacles, you've got to cross the rivers, you've got to deal with the challenges that the path sets in front of you. And so your path from point A to point B is not a straight line, it's a zigzaggy line as you're navigating your way to the path. So the question is, how do you make sure that you're going in the right direction? And I'm sure you know what that is. What you do is you pick a landmark. It could be a prominent mountaintop or a hill, you know, a prominent feature in the geography, something that's immovable, something that's not going to change. And you set your compass, you look at your compass and you go, okay, I need to go southwest. And actually, that, that peak of that mountain, that is southwest. So as long as I'm basically heading toward that mountain, 
I'm okay, I'll get there in the end. And then all of a sudden you come across a river and you go, oops, I've got to walk a kilometre down the river to find a place to ford it, I'm now going the wrong way. Well, you are going the wrong way and you aren't going the wrong way. It's just the path from where you are to that mountaintop requires that you turn left and walk a kilometre well, in this direction before you can find a place to cross, before you can then reset your compass back on that mountaintop and keep walking. And it reflects so much, I think, of our spiritual life, that we have, I think, uh, God plants in our hearts and we desire to have more of the life of Jesus living in us so the grace and the love and the goodness and the forgiveness and the mercy of God can be seen through us into the lives of the people around us. And then we hit obstacles. Then we hit dense forests and thorny bushes and raging rivers and we get knocked off course as we're trying to navigate some of these challenging and difficult areas. And in one way of thinking, we can say, oh, well, I'm off course. You know, I'm turned away from the direction I was heading in. I must be a bad person. But actually, if we have the compass of the Word of God, if we have the map of the Word of God and the compass of the Spirit of God, if we have the desire to be working to, walking towards God, then even in those moments of life when we are knocked off course, when the circumstances of life require us to walk a circuitous route that may even make us feel like we're walking away from God rather than toward God, as long as we have the compass point of God, of living, uh, worshipping God through Jesus as our focal point, then guess what? At some point, you're going to pass the obstacle and you're going to get back on track. That's orienteering. That's what happens. Knocked off course but you keep the end goal in mind. And with the end goal in mind, you keep yourself on track. And I think this is what it means when Jesus says, be single, have a healthy eye, but literally be single, be focused in the direction that you have. And the contrast here is then Jesus says, but when your eye is unhealthy, non-single, distracted and divided, your whole body is filled with darkness. Try orienteering without a map and a compass. Try orienteering with a map and a compass, but give yourself, you know, four different destination points and try to get to them all at once. Are we going that way? No, I'm going this way. No, I'm going that way. It just, you start spinning around in circles, right? When you lose the focal point, what happens is you, you too easily just drift and then you start going around in circles and you find yourself in a situation in orienteering where you go, haven't I been here before? You know, you begin to have that experience where I thought I was moving forward, but actually all I'm doing is doing large circles round and around and around. And Jesus is saying here, you know, the eyes of the window into the soul. Now, is the light that comes in changes and shapes and affects the soul and the spirit that is within us. So what Jesus is saying, that a bad and an unhealthy eye is an eye that is attracted to and looks at the wrong things. So greed and self-focus can rob us of seeing a bigger vision that is bigger than us. One of the biggest traps we have when we place ourselves at the center of our own life is that we do not realize how small we are. And one of the, amb so one of the, the traps of that dream, uh, that dream poster that I put up earlier on is almost all of the visions and dreams fundamentally were about make me rich, make me important, make me powerful, and then I might give some money at the end. Right? But it's fundamentally about me. It's about improving my status and improving my position and improving my wealth and improving my power. And the problem is if that becomes the light that we think is guiding our life, what we keep forgetting is how small we are. What we, what we keep forgetting is that there is such a bigger vision of the world that God, of what God is doing in the world, but God is a God who works through communities, not just through little individual champions. And is the more we divide ourselves away from seeing ourselves as humbly, mercifully, forgivingly, if that's even a word, connected to the people around us, and the more we see ourselves as about my vision, my ambition, my dreams, my money, my wealth, my comfort, we may get the bigger house, we may get the nice car, we may get the private jet, but we find ourselves actually living in a, in a world that is our size, which is so much smaller than the world that God has called us to live in. Greed and self-focus can rob us of the big vision of what God is doing. No ro room remains in us for God or for the pursuits of his kingdom or his righteousness. It's almost like you're closing the blinds of your eye to anything that does not feed your own appetites or your own sense of importance or, or your own desire for wealth and power. But by closing your eyes to, uh, to the things of God, what happens is you end up plunging yourself into a darkness. 
to life of being absorbed with our own visions, our own goals and our own needs, but then we have no room for anything else that is bigger than us. And Jesus warns, he says, if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Have you ever met someone who is completely sold out on the vision of making themselves important? Have you ever met someone who's completely sold out on the vision of making themselves rich? Have you ever met someone who's completely sold out on the vision of living the life according to their terms without really caring about the consequences that has on the people around them? Have you ever met someone who lives a life in which they are the center of their universe and they are absolutely convinced that they should be the center of everybody else's universe too? Is that a person who's full of light? Is that a person who's full of goodness? Is that a person who's full of grace? Is that a person who's full of joy? Is that a person who actually brings life and light and goodness and grace into the world around them? Or is there a darkness that you experience in those interactions? A heaviness sometimes can be quite destructive, even toxic in those particular places. But here's the key. They think they're walking in light. They call that light. Look at me, I'm, I am getting richer. My bank account's going up. I've got, I just bought my third big house. I've got my six, six Mercedes Benz. You know, I've got three private jets. Look how successful, I'm living in the light. Be impressed by me. And what Jesus says is, if the light you think you have is actually darkness, then you're even in a worse state because that darkness, you, you're calling darkness light, which means you don't even know what darkness is anymore. What's the road back for a person? who lives in darkness and calls it light. It's a very hard and a very long road back. And the warning Jesus is saying is don't fool yourself. Don't allow yourself to come to a place where you chase after darkness, you call it light, and you can no longer tell the difference between the two. As a minister of the gospel, I often find myself having conversations. Like Jesus is so countercultural in so many ways to to tell the story of Jesus it's a story of sacrifice the story of self-giving the story of giving up his power in heaven to enter into the most humble station on earth it's about giving up his wealth and his position as the creator of all of eternity so that he can walk with and live with us it's a life of service a life of healing a life of gentleness a life of forgiveness a life of mercy a life of restoration and a life that ultimately put him on the cross to be executed executed and, uh, under false charges, false trumped up charges, because his life of goodness was so offensive. The light that he brought was exposed what everyone else was trying to call light, but he revealed it to be darkness, that they couldn't stand having the light in themselves revealed to be darkness, and the only solution was to kill the light. When we as Christians carry that message into the community around us, it is both amazing to me, but actually not surprising that people can look at that message and go, oh, that's, they, they just, I don't get it. They look at the light of the gospel and they can't look at it. They can't see it. They don't want to see it. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. This is a reflection in, uh, in John of uh, Jesus speaking about himself. I am the light of the world, and I've come into the world to show you the true light of God living among you, but in a way that you would never expect but in a way that I'm calling you to emulate and to follow in your own neighborhoods and in your own walk. But you know what? God's light came into the world. But the more the light shone, the more the reaction of the people around revealed that they loved the darkness more than they loved the light. And they closed their eyes to that light. So don't be surprised for each of us as we seek to live more in the light. That's not necessarily going to make you everyone's best friend or the champion of, of the world. You're not going to be put on a pedestal and showered with wealth and gifts and money and honor because you're trying to live the Jesus way. As a matter of fact, sometimes the more we live the Jesus way, the more we end up accidentally confronting some of the assumptions and the motivations that drive even the people close to us. And sometimes they can feel quite offended or quite confronted by just the values that we're living genuinely in the world around us. So your life will go where your eyes are looking. So the question really is, where are your eyes looking? When I was learning to drive, one of the warnings that my driving instructor gave me is you tend to drive where your eyes look. So if you're driving in a straight line and then you start looking to your right because maybe something's caught your eye, you go, oh, look at that. What happens is you tend to 
turn the car with you. And it takes actually some discipline and some practice to learn how to keep the car in a straight line while your eyes are going that way. So as a young driver, sometimes I go, whoa, sorry, you go, whoa, sorry, like that, right? right. Your eyes go, your, uh, your life will go where your eyes are looking. The same thing I think is true in our spiritual walk and in our everyday natural walk as well. What is it that your eye is set on? What is, it that the, what is the goal that is the ultimate goal of your life? Is it a temporal reality? Is the ultimate goal, the thing that you think will bring you that deeper sense of satisfaction, is it based upon a number in your bank account? Is it based upon a list of possessions that you get to have? Is it based upon the year you think you, you'll finally get to retire? Is it based upon a portfolio that you think you'll be able to build? Is it based upon a business that you think you'll be, you'll be able to create and will give you a sense of power and position within the world around us? Or is it based upon relationship? Is it based upon connection? Is it based upon mercy? Is it based upon love? Is it based upon grace? What, are the, what is the ultimate value? What is the ultimate value, the ultimate direction that your life is going in? And the encouragement in the context of Matthew chapter 6 really is that what Jesus is saying to us is seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the values that Jesus is shown to us through his life and actually through his death and then through his resurrection assures us that the victory of God is assured. These values will be the values that win out. But what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6 is seek first the kingdom of God, make the values of God, make the mission of Jesus, make the life of Jesus the life that inspires us and shapes us. If we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, then we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, will purify us from all sins. We'll be able to enter into the covenant, the new covenant. That's some Old Testament imagery there, but picking up the idea of the new covenant, the forgiveness of God and the way that we are welcomed into his family. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. and The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I want to take you to a time of quiet reflection. This is not conversation, but I want to give you a few minutes. And I want you to reflect on these three questions. So first is this. Ask yourself the question, are you looking into the light or are you looking into the darkness but calling it light? Are you looking into the light or are you looking into darkness but calling it light? Second question is, what part of God's light would you like to fill your soul if our eyes are a window to the soul, if the light that comes in through our eyes is the light that forms who we are and shapes who we are, if we had a dream board that we put up now in our more mature years, what would we actually put on that dream board? What is it the thing that we would look at every day to inspire us and feed our soul and, you know, and motivate us into action? What part of God's light would you like to fill your soul? And I've just given some examples, maybe more of God's love or God's grace or God's mercy or God's forgiveness. You know, what is it for you? Don't say all the above, that's too broad. Pick one, pick something which for you specifically in whatever context you're in is particularly meaningful. What, what part of God's light would you like to have fill your soul? And then the final question, how can you make God's light the focus of your life? Is your orient, orienteering your way through life? Yeah, being distracted and knocked off course and having to face and deal with obstacles along the way. What is the end point that you're nonetheless going to continue to move toward? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes of quiet reflection and invite you to maintain a prayerful space as we consider these questions. your forgiveness, your righteousness, your justice, your hope, your peace, living in our life. Lord God, it is so easy to be distracted and caught up with ambitions which we might call light, but actually don't lead us into true light. Don't lead us into true fellowship, true love, true community, true goodness for the world around us. I pray, Lord God, that you would do your wonderful and kind and gracious work by your Holy Spirit of doing a little bit of a heart transplant within us, 
shifting our focus, shifting our affections to be more caught up with the things of you and less caught up with the things of ourselves. Father, give, give us wisdom. We do need to, to, to walk a life in which we are people. We have, we have uh, responsibilities. We have obligations. We have opportunities in the world around us through our work and through many other parts of the life that you've given us. And just give us wisdom to be able to walk the path of life well. But in each step of the way, I pray, Lord God, that we would have our compass orientated to the ultimate purposes of seeing more of the life of Jesus shine through our lives. Oh God, thank you for the, for the opportunity we've had this morning to reflect on these things and we ask that you will continue to do your good work in each of our hearts. We commit these things into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.